Alrighty, shall we get started? Okay, so um, uh, last time I made a uh, fatal error of uh, attempting to talk about supersymmetry twisters and momentum twisters in one lecture. Um, and that meant that I went very fast through the Susie stuff. And um, I realized uh, sort of three quarters of the way through that um, uh, I also broke one of my vows, which was that everything in the course was supposed to be self-contained. So there's all this Grassmann crapola that went flying by that if you haven't seen it before, it probably meant nothing to you. Um, and uh, it also meant that I made a mistake um, uh, in a formula, which is itself not a big deal, but also I failed to make a conceptual point, which really is a big deal. Um, so anyway, um, uh, so um, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, rush again. In fact, I just want to go back and tell you in a totally self-contained way um, what you need to know about the uh, maximal Susie. We're not going to do the entire previous lecture again, but I'm going to sort of summarize it more succinctly and, um, uh, and make the uh, conceptual points that I, uh, I wanted to make uh, as well. So, um, uh, so what I'm going to write are the equations you need to know about supersymmetry. It'll be entirely, as I said, hopefully entirely self-contained. Self even if you've never seen some Grassman stuff, we'll even do some uh, concrete Grassman manipulation examples just so you're comfortable with that. And um, if this ever happens again, it shouldn't be up to me to realize that I've made a terrible mistake. Uh, one of you should tell me that I'm fucking up and going too fast and tell me to slow down. Okay, so I'm disappointed in you. There was one <laughs> deeply disappointed. <laughs> There's only one student in this class who, had, who, who, who told me, uh, and it was not the kind of student I wanted it to be. So anyway. Uh, <laughs> so um, all right. So. Uh, so uh, uh, the SUSY algebra, and if you don't care about algebras, you can ignore this 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 part. Okay, um, but the uh, the SUSY algebra gives us a bunch of um, uh, uh, generators Q and Q tilde that anti-commute with each other. In general, they anti-commute to a momentum operator, but acting on on these on-shell states. The momenta are just equal to lambda lambda tilde, so we get a formula like lambda lambda tilde uh, delta ij. Okay, and what we said is that it's a good idea to diagonalize as much of the Susies as we can. So we can introduce these Grassmann coherent states, which are either eigenstates of Q alpha. Okay, so and there's a there's implicit in here a lambda that the state. Let me write it once and for all. There's a lambda and a lambda tilde, but we care about this dependence on the Grassmann variable eta tilde um, with a lower i. Uh, and this is equal to uh, lambda alpha eta tilde i uh, on lambda lambda tilde and eta tilde. Or you could equivalently, uh, you could alternately choose to diagonalize q tilde. These are not the same. Okay, so these are different states. We could call these states eta i. And this would be uh, lambda tilde alpha dot eta with an upper index. Eta. And all of this makes sense for any amount of supersymmetry, whether you have i equals 1 up to any number uh, n of Susie's. Okay, so this is a strategy that you can apply for any amount of supersymmetry. But life is especially nice with maximal supersymmetry, because with maximal supersymmetry, we can use either n equals 4 if we're talking about Yang Mills or n equals 8, if we're talking about gravity, we can use the Susies to put all the particles that we care about of all helicities into one multiplet together. So if we talk about n equals 4 Yang Mills, then we have one gluon of helicity plus 1. We have four, uh, four fermions of helicity plus a half. We have six scalars of helicity 0, four fermions of helicity minus a half, and one gluon of, uh, of, of spin minus one. Now, what would we have in a, uh, what would we have for an n equals one supersymmetric theory? n equals one supersymmetric theory, we'd have one, let's say, gluon, and one partner of it, which would be a half. And separately, we'd have to have another multiplet with a gluon of a helicity minus one and a gluon of helicity negative a half. So with n equals one or any amount less than maximal supersymmetry, these are separate multiplets. Okay? But with n equals 4 supersymmetry, starting with gluons, the, the top gluon, we can apply the four Susies to get us all the way down to the bottom. Starting at the bottom, we can apply all the four to get to the top. 
Okay, so similarly with n equals 8 supergravity, we get the eighth row of Pascal's triangle. So we have one guy of spin 2, 8, uh, 28, 56, 70, um, uh, 56, 28, and 1. Uh, of, so we have 8 gravitini. We have uh, 28, you could call gravitophotons uh, somehow. Uh, sometime you have 56 uh, gravigaginos. You have 70 scalars and so on. Okay, so that's the multiple count. Those, that's the helicity information, but these etas and eta or eta tildes are a nice linear combination of all these states that transform as nicely as possible under supersymmetry. So that, as we said, the state eta tilde is, for example, for, uh, for n equals 4, and you can do the same exercise for n equals 8, is the plus helicity guy, plus 1, plus, now we have four of these guys that have uh, spin a half, uh, uh, that have helicity plus a half, and they're weighted plus, a plus eta tilde i. And then we have the six Now, remember, what are all these guys? Because the etas, uh, the eta tildes are anti-commuting. We have to have eta tilde i, eta tilde j equals negative eta tilde j, eta tilde i. Okay, any polynomial in a given eta tilde, in one eta tilde, it has some indices. It has this, these four indices. We can think of it as some SU4 symmetry. And so any polynomial in one variable is anti-symmetric in those indices. Okay, so that's how... And so, uh, so that's why there's four of these. There are six of these. Three anti-symmetric indices upstairs. You can lower them with a four-dimensional epsilon symbol and get, uh, and get one, uh, one index downstairs. So we get four of these guys. And again, this is totally anti-symmetric, so it's proportional to the epsilon symbol. And again, we get just a single, single state. OK. Um, so. Uh, in, in this eta tilde basis, what are q and q tilde? So q alpha i is like lambda alpha eta i, and q tilde alpha dot upstairs i is lambda alpha d d eta i. So q tilde translates, uh, sorry, eta tilde. q tilde translates in the eta tilde direction. It translates all the eta tildes by something uh, proportional to, the, uh, to lambda alpha. Um, sorry, lambda tilde. And uh, more pieces of uh, kinematics. If you want to go back and forth between these two representations, they're related by a Fourier transform. So the eta state that we defined there is the integral dn eta tilde e to the uh, eta tilde eta eta tilde. This is a Grassmann integration. If you don't know about it, never mind. We'll come to it. Uh, We'll, we'll do analogous things uh, in a bit, but you're not going to need to know this for anything that we do. Okay? If you do know about it, have, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a trivial thing. Uh, sorry? Yes, this is all eta tilde. Thank you. OK. So a few more kinematical things. Now when we work in terms of lambdas, lambda tildes, and eta tildes, so this, is, this is the real summary now of the properties. Now we have super amplitudes, right? They're functions of lambda, lambda, tilde, and eta, tilde. These are super amplitudes. This is a polynomial in the eta tildes, right? This is some polynomial, polynomial 
in all the eta tildes. And you can read off the different helicity components simply from what we said. In any given one variable, this is a big polynomial. It would have a piece that looks like eta tilde 1 to the fourth. Okay? That piece will give us the negative helicity gluon for particle 1. Um, if it's uh, no powers of eta tilde 1 at all, then that's a positive helicity gluon. It could be eta tilde cubed, in which case it's a negative uh, a half helicity fermion. It could be eta tilde squared, which means there's two indices, so it's anti-symmetric in those two indices, so it's that scalar component in the multiple. Okay, so this is a big polynomial in all the eta tildes, and it's packaging together all of the different helicity uh, amplitudes into one object. Now, at this point, we tend to introduce a variable called k. I will call it k hat. Um, okay, so there's a variable k hat. Because this is a polynomial in eta tilde, it's reasonable to, uh, it's reasonable to uh, decompose it into pieces that have different numbers of the eta tildes in them. Right? Now, let's think about how many eta tildes we can possibly have. Because we have these uh, four indices here, and everything is everything is uh, only contracted, these four indices can only be contracted by the epsilon symbol, okay? Um, uh, and M itself doesn't have any of these indices, right? Then M can either have no eta tildes, four eta tildes, and they might be contracted with the epsilon symbol somehow, eight eta tildes, so it has to have a multiple of four eta tildes in it, okay? So, so we, we, we tend to write MN of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde as a sum over k hat of something you might call m and k hat of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde, where this thing has precisely four k hat eta tildes in it. Is that clear? No, that's not clear. So what's, what's, what's your question about it? So, so this is a polynomial in the eta tildes, right? So you just expand it out. It can't have a piece that just looks like eta tilde, one, a single eta tilde. Why can't it have a piece with a single eta tilde? Because a single eta tilde has this i index, right? There are four of these i's. The whole answer doesn't have any i indices. So I can't have a, anything in this polynomial. I can't have just a single, I can't have a single, uh, I can't have a single eta tilde. The whole object has no eta, uh, have, has none of these i indices at all. So I have, and the only, but the only uh, invariant tensor that I have is the anti-symmetric tensor to contract all of these uh, indices with. So since there are four of them, they have to come in groups of four. So I could have, in principle, something that looks like eta tilde one, eta tilde two, eta tilde three, eta tilde four, for four different things and contract them all together. I could have that in principle. Okay, I mean just just at this level, I could uh, uh, um, uh, I could have that. So uh, so this is going to be a polynomial in these Grassmann variables and. Um, and uh, we're just giving it a name uh, for k hat. The reason for, pu for putting a k hat there will be apparent in, in a second, because um, as, we, as we saw last time, and I'll quickly review, when k hat is 0 or k hat is 1, these amplitudes are 0. Okay, so it's kind of uh, it's useful to begin with k hat equals 2, where the amplitudes are first non-zero. So we'll define k to be uh, k hat minus 2. Okay, so, so to have something uh, right. Um, sorry? That's right. This independence of i is because we have this uh, SU4. We have a we have a symmetry that rotates all these q's uh, into each other. Okay, so that's the SU n r symmetry in this case. It's the SU4 or SU8 r symmetry. Um, okay. All right. So um, so that's one thing. Uh, also, uh, more basic uh, uh, kinematics is what do we know about the weights? Um, about the uh, helicity weight, we know that m of t lambda, t inverse lambda tilde, and t inverse eta tilde. Okay, so t t a lambda a. That this goes like t a to the minus two s uh, m of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde. Where again, s equals one for super Yang Mills and two for super gravity. Okay, so that's uh, all the business about the helicities is taken care of by that. Um, another useful fact is that whenever we have any expression, it doesn't matter what we're doing with it, but whenever we have any expression where normally 
we would sum over helicities. The sum over the helicities on the inside is replaced by an integral over the eta tilde. So whatever we have is we have some m left, blah, 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 the eta tilde for the internal line, and then m right, eta tilde, everything else. So if this was some left and right, the sum over helicities is re replaced simply by uh, an integration over the intermediate eta tilde. Sorry? Oh, little a in, uh, always is, is uh, running over uh, particles. A uh, little a runs from 1 to n. Okay? So if we have an n particle scattering, uh, the, uh, little a is a label for the particle. We can, but we have to have a total of four etas, okay? Because each one of them has an R symmetry index. So, okay. yeah. They can involve a lot of different etas. Yeah, we'll do an example in a second. They would involve a lot of different etas, but the total number of eta tildes they have to be uh, has to be a multiple of four because of the SU4 R symmetry. Okay? And in fact, all the different ways that you can all that you can distribute these eta tildes are all the different helicity components that you could actually have in the amplitude. Okay. Um, so uh, Now, finally, wh what does it mean for an amplitude to be supersymmetric? I can give you any function of these lambda, lambda tildes, and eta tildes that uh, has weight uh, 4k. Oh, sorry. Uh, before doing that, what are some of the symmetry properties? Uh, some of the, well, so let me just write down. For super Yang Mills, when we talk about an ordered amplitude, one of these color ordered amplitudes, okay, remember, uh, there's a clear sense in which there's an ordering for the external lines, uh, 1 through to n. And even when we saw the Park-Taylor amplitude, there's this beautiful cyclic structure, a cyclically symmetric structure in the denominator of the Park-Taylor formula. But the actual amplitude was not invariant, of course, because two of them are negative helicity, the rest are positive helicity, and so on. When we label the states with the eta tildes, everything is as symmetric as possible. <laughs> All the states are being labeled the same way. And therefore, in super Yang mills when I, uh, as a super amplitude, this m is just literally cyclically invariant. 2, 3, 4, blah, and 1. Okay? So that's the power of having combined all the helicities together in one object. When we do supergravity, it's a even nicer. The amplitude for 1, 2, up to n is fully permutation invariant. Sigma of 1, sigma of 2, any permutation, sigma of n. So, so this is cyclically invariant. And this is permutation invariant. So, so far, all of these things are basically a consequence of the labeling. We've labeled all these things together very nicely. Um, uh, and so finally, we should just say what the statement of the symmetry is, uh, uh, the, the statement of the supersymmetry. And the statement of the SUSY is simply that Q and Q tilde, summed over all particles, should annihilate the amplitude. So SUSY says, says that the sum over A of QA alpha M should equal zero, which tells us that the sum over A, lambda A eta tilde I, I'll put the alpha up here, on M should equal zero. So one and two, or well, Q and Q tilde, we learn the sum over A of of Q tilde A alpha dot on M should equal zero. That tells us that this differential operator, lambda tilde A alpha dot D by D eta tilde I on M should equal zero. Okay, so if you hand me some function of eta, lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde that satisfies all of these sort of uh, trivial kinematical things, the weight uh, of order 4k in the eta tildes, um, this is the uh, dynamical content that it has to be annihilated by both of these things. One of them is a multiplicative operator, the other one is a differential operator. This says that you can just translate the eta tildes, as we said, by anything proportional to lambda tilde and the answer should not change. Okay? Now, now let's do some Grassmann exercises, just so we uh, just so we have our uh, head screwed on straight. 
it's going to be one of the little delights of this uh, course that Mr. Grassmann, who was actually a mister and not even a professor, he was a high school teacher in Germany in the mid 1800s, okay? Uh, uh, Mr. Grassmann is going to show up in the subject all over the place. First here in the more familiar context of Susie, and later when we talk about Grassmannians. And it's literally the same Mr. Grassmann. And again, as I've said many times, once we get into the Grassmannian frame of mind, all of these things are going to be obvious. The Susie will be obvious. So they're even related to each other. So Mr. Grassmann was 150 years ahead of his time from this, uh, from this uh, point of view. In fairness, Felix Klein realized that he was onto something, but uh, long after he was dead. So. All right, so, uh, so let's talk about Grassmann variables. Just so I don't litter things with tildes here, I'm, I'm going to just uh, drop tildes. It's just generic things uh, for a moment with uh, Grassmann variables. So we have Grassmann variables like eta. Maybe there's many of them, eta i. But uh, their important property is just that eta i, eta j equals negative eta j, eta i. And in particular, that eta i squared equals 0. Okay, so as I've said already, in our context, if we have any polynomial in the eta tildes, like eta tilde uh, i1, eta tilde 1, i2, well, well, anything else that I want to do with it, this tells me already, whatever this thing is, in terms of i1 and i2, it's totally anti-symmetric. In i1, i2, just because of that basic identity. And as we've said already, that's how, that's how from a huge polynomial made out of eta tildes, we pick off the components that correspond to the different helicities and the particles with the transforming in different representation of the SU4R, right? Either the, the singlet, one index upstairs, two index upstairs, three index upstairs, four index upstairs. Okay? Now, um, because eta squared is zero, there is a useful notion of a Grassmann delta function. Let's say you just have a single variable eta. Um, what should I mean by delta of eta? Well, de uh, if it's a normal variable, you want delta of x to satisfy many properties. But one of them is that, uh, that if you evaluate like x delta of x, you get 0. Okay? So here, delta of eta is just defined to be eta if it's a Grassmann variable. right? And that guarantees that eta delta of eta is indeed equal to 0. You see, um, you could say, why, don't I, why, don't, why do I write delta of eta? Why don't I just always write down eta? Well, we'll see that in just, just a moment. In fact, let's just see it, let's just see it now. Um, uh, before going there, let me make a little comment. Uh, what is delta of 2 eta? Well, delta of 2 eta is 2 eta. This is 2 delta of eta. Okay, and that's the sense, as usual, with the, if you're familiar with the, these manipulations, this is different than for bosonic variables, where delta of 2x is equal to 1 half delta of x, okay, for ordinary bosonic variables. Okay, so uh, the, the Jacobian is upstairs rather than downstairs when you have these uh, fermionic delta functions. Now, let's say we have a whole stack of these eta variables, and I want to take many linear combinations of them. Okay, so, so, um, so let's say I have, I have an expression that, uh, uh, that, that looks something like a delta of a k times n of something that we're going to encounter this sort of thing all the time. A sum over all the etas, or even let's say the, uh, but let's just, uh, of, of some uh, c alpha a eta i. And so here, alpha is going to run from 1 to k, and i is going to run from 1 to n. So just think of this. So, so what is this? Each one of these guys for every alpha, let's say I put alpha equals 1, right? So I just had one of them. This is just com combination c1, eta, i, plus, uh, uh, sorry, c1, eta, 1, plus c2, eta, 2, plus c3, eta, 3, and so on, right? OK, so, um, so what is this? Well, just by this rule, Every row, for, for alpha equals 1, I get some c11 a to 1i plus c12 a to 2i plus dot, dot, dot. That's what I get for alpha equals 1. Then I get c21 a to 1i plus c22 a to 2i plus dot, dot, dot for the next row and so on. 
So what is this? Just by definition, this is just the product over all the alphas and all the i's of this thing. That's just generalizing. Right? So delta of eta is eta. If I have delta of eta 1, delta of eta 2, right? Uh, if I have uh, two equations, it's just the product of all of them, right? Just a product over all the alphas and the i's of, uh, of uh, exactly this uh, object, of sum over a c alpha a a to a i. OK, so why do we bother writing it as delta? Well, um, because well, it does all the things that delta is supposed to do. And it's really for the same reason when you have more than one variable. We write something like, uh, for bosonic variables, we write d4 delta 4x, let's say. You're doing something. What's nice about delta 4x? Of course, in any frame, any component, delta 4x is delta x1, delta x2, delta x3, delta x4. But why do we write delta 4x? Because delta 4x actually behaves nicely if, if someone comes along and decides to do a, a change of variable, just a linear transformation on the x's. So their x's are some linear combination of your x's. The nice thing about writing this object delta 4x is that it behaves nicely under linear transformations. You just pull out the determinant of, that, uh, of, the, of, of the matrix of the transformation times delta 4x. So that's what's nice about this notation when we write delta of something, is it behaves nicely under linear transformations of the argument. Okay? As, and of course, it's, it's, it's intuitively obvious. It's trivial to derive. And what is the analog here? So let's say I have k of these equations. So let's say I do a k by k linear transformation on this alpha variable. So I'm looking at delta kn now of some l alpha beta times this whole thing, right? Times sum of c beta a, a to a i. This is just the determinant of this transformation now upstairs, not downstairs, for the same reason as we saw before, to the power of n times delta of what we had before. Okay, So that's, what's, uh, that's one nice thing about this notation. But again, all it is is just a product, literally a product. That's how we get a polynomial. You just literally get a product of all these uh, eta tildes. OK. Now we'll see this in action in a moment. But let me go back and, and let's use this to uh, uh, say again something we said last time, that the Q Suzy in order for the Q Suzy to be obvious, it's a multiplicative thing, right? So I take the sum of lambda eta. If I multiply it by the superamplitude, I have to get 0. How can I possibly have it be 0? Well, that means that the superamplitude has to have a delta of Q in it. Okay. So that's how we learn that every superamplitude, every amplitude looks like, uh, looks like a delta 2 times n the sum over a lambda a eta tilde a uh, eta tilde i times something. You could call that m hat, let's say. OK? So that's how we're guaranteed that it will be supersymmetric. We'll come to a tiny counterexample to this when we talk about the three particle amplitudes, but generically, this, this has, has to be the case. All right? All right, and we gave an example. We, uh, oh, sorry. And this also lets us conclude a few things immediately, right? Because, for, for instance, uh, if I'm doing super Yang Mills, that means that every amplitude has a delta 2 times 4 in it. And that means that everything, no matter what else is here, is at least a polynomial of degree 8 in the eta tildes, right? So that's why that's the motivation for that definition of k hat. Because if k hat is 0 or 1, just by supersymmetry, the amplitude vanishes. OK? And of course, we can make the same argument. Uh, well, okay, well, let me just say that for now. OK? So far, so good? OK, and then we gave an example uh, last time of a, of a sort of simplest amplitude we can start looking at, the supersymmetric Park-Taylor amplitude. So let me write that down again. The, the n hats could definitely have eta tildes. Absolutely. Yeah. So this now, absolutely. 
So this thing can, can still be a function of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde. And in fact, this is a thing that we'll typically write as a sum of, let's say, m hat and k. Okay? Lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde. Okay? So k hat of from before is equal to k plus 2. And that extra plus 2 is taken up by these uh, by the delta functions that we have there. All right, so we gave an example of the Park Taylor amplitude. So we said M Park Taylor Susie is just this has just this one factor. Okay. So let's now actually play with this a little bit and see how this thing contains all many different helicity components. Okay, so let's just explicitly work out what this uh, what this numerator is as a polynomial in the eta tilde. Yes. Oh no! So th this is just the so sorry. Let me just say this is the uh, this is the tree amplitude for n and k hat equals two. Okay, it's that part of the super amplitude. We're now we're in a moment going to interpret k hat as that sector uh, of that part of the super amplitude that contains within its components the one with two gluons, with k hat gluons of negative helicity and the remainder of positive helicity. So that's the interpretation of k hat. Of course, it's a big super amplitude that contains all sorts of other components, but it is that component that has the one with k hat negative helicity and the remainder positive helicity. And we're gonna, we'll see that uh, explicitly now. All right, so now all I want to do is expand this polynomial out. And we could, of course, do it very slickly. And that's what I did last time. I just wrote down the answer. But let's uh, just, just so you see it once and for all, and then you should do a few exercises like this for yourself. Let's be totally boneheaded. OK? So we should always be boneheaded first. So let's say, um, let's look at a piece of this polynomial um, where uh, what we did last time. We set a, all, a bunch of the eta tilde to 0, but two of them. We know that we have to have at least two because um, we can't just have one, right? Because that would just give us some eta tilde to the fourth. We have to have at least two. So let's put two of them. Let's put all to zero except, let's say, one and two. So what I want to do is stare at delta two times four of lambda one alpha eta tilde one i plus lambda two alpha eta tilde two i. OK? Now, so what is this? So first of all, what are these vectors lambda one and lambda two? Well, they're just some two-dimensional vector. So in principle, lambda 1 alpha could be like a1, b1, and lambda 2 alpha could be a2, b2. OK? And we could just, so like literally, literally, what, what, what we're doing is there's the product over i. Then one factor would be a1, a to tilde 1 i, plus a2, a to tilde 2 i. And another factor would be b1 eta tilde 1 i plus b2 eta tilde 2 i. OK, so that's literally what we're computing. All right, so you see it's a big polynomial in eta tilde 1 and eta tilde 2. All right, but let's make our life slightly easier. Um, we know that this delta function behaves nicely on if I do 2 by 2 linear transformations on these lambdas, right? That's the whole point of this delta function. So I can always do a 2 by 2 linear transformation, an SL2 transformation, to let's say bring this lambda 1 to a form that just looks like a1, 0, and lambda 2 to a form that looks like 0, b2. So let's just do that. Okay? So I'm going to slightly simplify the situation, just, uh, just so we do it a little more quickly, and then you'll, but you'll appreciate where all these brackets are coming from in a second. So I'm going to say that lambda 1 goes to that, and lambda 2 goes to that. In which case, what is this expression? This is just equal to the product over all the i, a1 eta tilde 1 i, and then the, uh, 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 another product over i of b2 eta tilde 2 i. OK, so, so what is this? This is a1 b2 to the fourth times eta tilde 1 to the fourth, where I mean here I just have i1, i2, i3, i4, totally anti-symmetrized, and eta 2 to the fourth. OK? 
Okay? But what is this A1, B2? I've chosen a particular frame, but I know that the answer has to be invariant under SL2 transformation. So what is A1, B2? A1, B2 is nothing other than this bracket, lambda 1, lambda 2 to the fourth. Okay? And that's what the answer would have been um, had we not done this uh, change of variable to bring the form A100B2. Zero, zero, uh, Let's say we hadn't done it. Then in this big product, now you'd have a bunch of different terms here, right? Um, now, now I can get A to the tilde 1 and A to the tilde 2 from both terms. And then you can very easily see that from the anti-symmetrization, what I'd get is A1B2 minus A2B1 to the fourth. Okay? So that's exactly the bracket 1, 2 to the fourth. Okay? But let's just continue in this boneheaded way uh, and look at what happens if I uh, turn on three eta tilde. So that's, that's all I can get when I turn on uh, just two eta tilde. So there's a component of this whole super amplitude that has particles three through four all be plus one helicity gluons, and particles one and two are minus helicity gluons, and the amplitude picks up this extra factor of one, two to the fourth. Okay? And right, so that's exactly what we expected from the part Taylor formula, this ij to the fourth upstairs. Okay, let's do another example. Let's say I, I turn on three of the eta tildes. Of course, you can just go on in this way. And, and the, the general formula is very easy to understand, but I just want to do it this way simply once and for all. So let's say I have, uh, so, so another, so now let's say I have three eta tildes, non-zero. OK, so, um, so again, I'm just looking at delta 2 times 4 lambda 1, eta tilde 1, now plus lambda 2, eta tilde 2, plus lambda 3, eta tilde 3. And le let me again do my, allow myself just to make my life a little simpler to put two of them, let's say lambda 1 and lambda 2 to this form, right? Then lambda 3, I'm stuck. I can't necessarily put it in that form. So I'm going to put lambda 1 equals a0, lambda 2 equals 0b, and lambda 3 equals cd. OK, so what is this? What is our Susie delta function there? It is the product over i. So this delta function is the product over i, a eta tilde 1i plus c eta tilde 3i, from one term, and another product over i, b eta tilde 2i plus d eta tilde 3i. OK? So what do we get out of this guy? Okay, so for instance, it has one piece where, where it looks like, uh, um, in, in this product over i, it has one piece that looks like a to the fourth, a to tilde 1 to the fourth, okay, four of them. It has another piece, I'm ignoring factors, that looks like a cubed c times a to tilde 1 cubed, a to tilde 3, and so on, right? Plus, uh, let's do another one, <laughs> obviously a squared c squared, where there's 2 a to tilde 1 and 2 a to tilde 3. Now, let me be, let's be very careful about this. So what is this expression, right? This is really something that has an anti-symmetric ij index, another anti-symmetric kl index, and they're all contracted together. So very explicitly, this is some eta tilde 1 cubed ijk, eta tilde 3 l, with an epsilon ijk l. Right? This would be an eta tilde 1 squared ij, eta tilde 3 squared kl, again, epsilon ijk l. If we raise and lowered indices, it would look slightly nicer, right? So um, just over here, if I put it over here, a to tilde 1 cubed a to tilde 3 is actually a to tilde 1 cubed with a downstairs index. Uh, sorry, with an, yeah, with a, with a uh, oh, sh shoot, sorry. I think I, did I give these guys these a to tilde upstairs or downstairs indices? I think I gave them downstairs indices. 
I apologize. So there's some i, j, k, l down here, and the epsilons are upstairs. Okay, so this is some two indices downstairs. By the way, where are these epsilons coming from? Simply from the fact that the eta tildes are anti-symmetric, right? There's nothing I can do about it. The answer is just the same as, uh, and in fact, the epsilons take away the factorials <laughs> in the, uh, anyway. All right, so, so this thing is really more nicely written as an eta tilde one cubed with an upstairs index times an eta tilde three with a downstairs index and so on. Okay, so this thing, eta tilde one squared, eta tilde three squared is, we can nicely write as an eta tilde one squared with two upstairs ij indices and eta tilde three squared with two downstairs ij indices and so on. Okay, so this is all just SU forology. Okay, so uh, but now let's let's finish. So 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 one piece. So let's. Uh, I'm not going to do all of them, but we have something like a to the fourth, a to tilde one to the fourth, and we had a cubed c a to tilde 1 cubed um, a to 3, a to tilde 3, plus a squared c squared, a to tilde 1 squared, a to tilde 3 squared, plus dot dot. And then the other one has, let's say, b to the fourth, a to tilde 2 to the fourth. And I'm getting tired, so I won't write the rest of them. OK, but now let's look at the various pieces. So one piece is a to the fourth, b to the fourth. That's the one that we looked at already. So one piece looks like. So this contains a to the fourth, b to the fourth, a to tilde one to the fourth, a to tilde two to the fourth. So that's the, uh, okay, so that's one piece. Another piece looks like, let's look at this guy. It looks like uh, a cubed c, b to the fourth, and then we have a to tilde one cubed, a to tilde three, a to tilde two to the fourth, and let's look at this last one, plus a squared, c squared, b to the fourth, a to tilde one squared, a to tilde three squared, a to tilde two to the fourth, plus dot, dot, dot. So you see it's a giant, gigantic object. But what are all these different pieces? So first of all, let's write them back in terms of invariant brackets, right? That was in this frame, but now we can clearly recognize all the object as made out of brackets. So, so, uh, so that expression. The first piece is angle bracket 1, 2 to the fourth, eta tilde 1 to the fourth, eta tilde 2 to the fourth. What is the next piece? The a cubed c. Well, a cubed b cubed is 1, 2 cubed, right? 1, 2 is just a, b. So this is plus 1, 2 cubed. And I also have, uh, I also have a c, b. And what is c, b? c, b is 2, 3. times eta tilde 1 cubed, eta tilde 3, eta tilde 2 to the fourth. And then I have another piece. The a squared c squared b to the fourth now looks like 1, 2 squared and 2, 3 squared. Again, uh, eta tilde 1 squared, eta tilde 3 squared, eta tilde 2 to the fourth, plus dot, dot, dot. OK, and so now we see. This guy has all these different components. This component is, so from here we learn, from here we learn that the amplitude for one, for one minus two minus three plus blah, 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 is equal to one two to the fourth times everything that we had. But what is this guy? 1, 2 cubed, 2, 3. Well, from here, we learn eta tilde 1 cubed is one of the negative helicity gauge genomes. Eta tilde 3 is one of the positive helicity gauge genomes. OK, and so one has an upstairs R symmetry index. The other one has a downstairs R symmetry index. So I could say, for example, mi upstairs for particle 1, downstairs for particle 3. And um, then uh, so particle 1 has, has uh, uh, negative helicity. Um, Particle 3 has positive helicity, and um, particle 2 has negative helicity. So this is negative a half, positive a half, and particle 2 has, uh, has uh, negative helicity. 
Okay? And then everyone else has posi ev everyone else has uh, positive helicity. All the other gluons have are gluons and positive helicity. So this is a subamplitude with two fermions uh, and all the rest gluons. And this gives me exactly the same factor multiplied by 1, 2 cubed. Uh, so it's delta ij. So in, in, uh, in SU4 R symmetry space, it's just delta ij. All these things are either epsilons or deltas in, in, uh, in R symmetry space. Um, but the dependence on 1, 2 is, again, what you could have just precisely predicted also from the helicity weight. All right, so particle two, there's four of the two is upstairs as before, but particle one now looks like a fermion. <laughs> there's three of them upstairs. Remember, there, there are two of everybody downstairs <laughs> from the Park Taylor factor, so that's how we can read off all the helicity. Finally, what about this guy? This guy is something where particles one and three are scalar. So one of them has two upstairs R symmetry indices, the other one has two downstairs R symmetry indices. Let me move them both upstairs, it doesn't really matter. Uh, then this is a scalar, zero. 2 is still a negative helicity gluon. 3 is a scalar. Everyone else is a positive helicity gluon. And this is equal to epsilon ijkl. Or you could lower two of them and it'd have a bunch of delta deltas. But anyway, then I have 1, 2 squared, 2, 3 squared. Remember, all of this is divided by 1, 2 up to n1 for the actual amplitude. So indeed, we see the helicity weights of 1 and 3 go away. They're scalars, and we have everyone else. OK? So if this was still fast, you should do it. For, but now you really should do it for yourself. Last time I felt bad. Now I've done my due diligence. OK? So if it's still too hard, screw you. You should just. Uh... <laughs> OK. So um, any questions about this? Uh, ignore what I said just a moment ago. <laughs> <laughs> Consistency is the hobgoblin of mediocre minds. You know that. Uh... No. Crystal clear. Crystal clear. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Now let's uh, 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 go back and uh, talk more systematically about the three-point supersymmetric amplitudes, and just so we can do our one. Last little, uh, the exception to this rule about k hat needing to be at least 2. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, just, just the comment, and I think it should be trivial from what I just said, that, 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 uh, that m, n, and k hat right, contains a piece that looks like a to tilde, you know, some set of a to tilde for some set of particles i1 to the fourth up to eta tilde i, I k hat to the fourth plus a bunch of other things. And therefore, this is the amplitude with particles i1 through a, i k hat negative helicity, everyone else positive helicity, and just the top spin. So if it's Yang Mills, it's gluons. If it's gravity, it's uh, gravitons. Well, let me, I'll, I'll just say it for gluons in this case. Well, gluons are gravitons. And we already saw that the Q Susy implies that K hat should be greater than or equal to 2. Now, it should be clear that if you can't have the amplitudes with, uh, with 0 or 1 negative velocity gluons, you also can't have the amplitudes for n minus 1 and n <laughs> negative helicity gluons just by parity. Okay? And so therefore, uh, and you can actually argue that very easily by Fourier transforming, uh, by doing this Grassmann Fourier transform back and forth if you really want to see it formally. But in any case, what, what, what we know is that the, the amplitudes m and k hat are, uh, are, are 0 unless, well, they're 0 for k hat equals 0 or 1 or n minus 1 or n if we have n particles scattered. How would we make that? Uh, again, so you, you can, uh, maybe this will be an exercise for your next uh, problem set, uh, just to see that from the q Susies you get one and from the q tilde Susies you get the other. Okay, and so, um, uh, 
All right. Except, as I said, for this little counterexample that we will now come to uh, for a three particle scatter. OK, so now let's talk about the uh, uh, SUSY three point amplitudes. And let's begin with the case of the configuration where all the lambdas are parallel. OK, and again, notice over and over again here, there's no helicity labels here anymore, right? Everything is going to be just functions of eta tilde. So, um, but this was the case, if you recall, where the lambda tildes were parallel. Black means the lambda tildes were all parallel in this configuration. And so this superamplitude is just delta 2 times 4, uh, delta 2 times n of um, lambda 1, eta tilde 1, plus lambda 3, eta tilde 3, over 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, to the power of the spin. So again, it's just 1 if it's the Yang-Mills and 2 if it's gravity. OK, but clearly there's something wrong, because we know that this amplitude is going to contain the guy with two negative helicity and one positive helicity uh, gluon, or graviton, and yet we have the other one as well. If we're going to have the other one, there has to be some k hat equals 1 amplitude. OK? So let's see what the issue is. Let's see why, uh, uh, let's see why we're allowed to have a k hat equals 1 amplitude. So again, I said this very quickly last time, but uh, let's be a little more explicitly uh, about it. So in order to do that, let's go to the, the white configuration where all the lambdas are parallel. When all the lambdas are parallel, The white configuration. Now, what was Q? So this means that since all the lambdas are parallel, I can say, like, let's say lambda 1 is equal to, I don't know, x1, 0. They're all parallel. So lambda 2 equals x2, 0. Lambda 3 equals x3, 0. All right? So they're all parallel to each other. I can always just do a SL2 rotation, uh, transformation to bring them to this form. And so what is Q? So Q alpha A is just equal to x1 eta tilde 1 plus x2 eta tilde 2 plus x3 eta tilde 3 and 0 down here. <laughs> OK? And so now you see why in this peculiar configuration where the lambdas are all parallel to each other, there is actually a little counterexample for how we can make something supersymmetric. See, we said we had to make something supersymmetric. The only way to make it supersymmetric is just to multiply by all the Qs, right? Except in this configuration, that's overkill. We don't need to do anything about this bottom row. It's already 0. Okay? So that's why all we need is to ensure that we multiply by that. See, if I multiply by x1 eta tilde 1 plus x2 eta tilde 2 plus x3 eta tilde 3, then, uh, then the, am the amplitude will uh, it'll be obviously supersymmetric, and the rest is trivially supersymmetric because it's multiplied by zero. So again, we see that in these degenerate configurations where the lambdas are, are parallel, and actually more generally for any amplitude, if you have any amplitude with any number of particles, but you're in a weird configuration where all the lambdas are parallel to each other, then you can have interesting superamplitudes. It's, uh, it's just that we normally don't think about those things for generic momenta, uh, for four particle scattering it above, um, but we're forced to think about them for three particle momenta because that's all we have. Okay? Now, let's work out what these x's can be because these x's aren't independent. We have to have momentum conservation, right? So, momentum conservation is now going to give us a, a constraint on the x's. So, wh what does it tell us? Uh, uh, lambda 1, lambda 1 tilde plus lambda 2, lambda 2 tilde plus lambda 3, lambda 3 tilde equals 0 tells me that all of these lambdas are proportional to the same vector. Okay, so let me call this like x1 times some rho, where rho, where rho is this uh, 1, 0. So this just tells me that x1, lambda tilde 1, plus x2, lambda tilde 2, plus x3, lambda tilde 3, 
is equal to 0, right? But that just tells me that whatever x1, x2, and x3 are, they have to be proportional. So the, the lambda tildes are generic, right? The lambda tildes are generic. So from here, we learn whatever the x1, x2, x3 are, they have to be proportional to that single identity that's satisfied between three two-dimensional vectors that allows you to express one in terms of the other. So there's a single linear relation between those vectors. So we learn, uh, what is that identity? That identity for two vectors is exactly 1, 2, lambda tilde 3, plus 2, 3, lambda tilde 1, plus 3, 1, lambda tilde 2 is 0. So we learn from here that x1, x2, x3, whatever the heck they are, have to be proportional to x1 has got to be proportional to 2, 3, x2 has got to be proportional to 3, 1, and x2 has got to be proportional to uh, 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 1, 2. OK? So how do we make something supersymmetric? We have to multiply by delta of this, and now we figured out how to express that in terms of uh, lambda tildes. And so we learned that just from Q Suzy, we have that this amplitude is equal to delta 1 times n, 1, 2, eta tilde 3, plus 2, 3, eta tilde 1, plus 3, 1, eta tilde 2, divided by now the other kind of bracket, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, to the power of a spin. OK, so you see what the how we exploited this little degeneracy of the kinematics in order to be able to write down something that violated our naive expectation. In fact, had we been careful from the beginning, we would have said that we have to multiply by both Qs if the two different components of Q alpha are actually independent. <laughs> right? And it just so happens, in this case, one of the rows is 0. <laughs> and so in that case, you can actually go down lower. All right. so. These are the basic super amplitudes. Um, and we're going to have a great amount of uh, fun with them. Of course, you can expand them out and get all the different helicity components, as, uh, as we did in, in our slightly more complicated example. So let me finally uh, write down the formula for the four-point amplitude that I wrote down. This is where I actually messed up last time. Uh, as I think Jake Bergeli asked me about the helicity weight of the object that I wrote down, and I was switching switching what I was trying to explain in the middle of the lecture, which is, uh, but as I said, it also deprived me of an opportunity to make a very important conceptual point. So let's, let's do it right. So let's go back to four-point superamplitudes. All right, so let's begin by writing down M Yang mil, M super Yang mills. Um, for 1, 2, 3, 4, just the, our, our favorite Park Taylor formula. I'll write it again. Uh, I'll write it as delta 2 times 4q. Uh, you know what that means now. For 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. OK, the first thing I want to do, so note this formula leaves nothing to be desired, right? It's cyclically invariant, super symmetric. Everything is uh, manifest. Oh, sorry. Ah, I forgot to say. Just coming back here. Um, we check the Q Suzy. Uh, we have to check the Q tilde Suzy, but the Q tilde Suzy is also uh, is trivially correct. And why is the Q tilde Suzy trivially correct in this case? We we said this uh, last time, but the Q tilde Suzy translates eta tilde um, in the in uh, in the direction of lambda tilde, right? So under Q tilde, this thing varies as one two lambda tilde three plus cyclic. And that's exactly the linear relation that's satisfied between the lambda tilde. Okay, so, sorry. So, so we derive the form from Q Suzy invariance, and it's Q tilde supersymmetric. And uh, we, we could have said that about the delta of Q in general. I should have said that on general grounds um, uh, for the delta 2 times 4, 2 times n Q. Uh, that object is also Q tilde supersymmetric because of what we said last time. When you do the shift on eta tilde, the argument um, uh, the argument shifts by something that vanishes because of momentum conservation. So because the sum of the lambda lambda tilde is a zero, the delta two times n of q is also q tilde supersymmetric. Yes. So when you, uh, multiply the yes. 
Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You can put any constant in there, but then everything would, uh, it would either get it would either get absorbed into the overall coupling constant that I haven't written down here, uh, and then this is just everything is fixed by the weights that it's uh, meant meant to have. All right. Sorry, I, 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 said that, I said that last time, but let me just uh, remind you that these Susie delta functions are actually invariant under both the Q and the Q tilde uh, supersymmetries, and so is this more degenerate form is invariant under both Q and Q tilde supersymmetries. Okay, so, so let's now come back to this expression. So it leaves nothing to be desired. It's manifestly cyclically symmetric. It's supersymmetric. Q, Q tilde supersymmetric, everything is great. Um, let's try to make it look slightly more familiar because this tells you that you have poles when, like angle bracket 1, 2, when any of these things go to 0. Let's try to make it look more like the poles that we're used to, like S and T channel poles. Okay? Of course, this thing actually has more information, because it actually tells you without any work that, yes, there's a pole when 1, 2 goes to 0. So that's when S goes to 0, when P1 plus P2, or P1, when P1 plus P2 squared goes to 0, or P1 dot P2 goes to 0, there's a pole. But it tells you how you have to reach that pole. You have to reach that pole by making the angle brackets between 1 and 2 uh, parallel, and the square brackets uh, aren't doing anything. If you make the square brackets parallel, nothing is uh, happening there, right? So, okay, so that's, uh, um, but let's try to make it look more, uh, let's try to make it look more familiar. Um, so what are the, so remember, what is S? S is like P1 plus P2 squared which is like P1 or 2, that's last time I'm going to write a 2. Okay, so this is uh, angle times square bracket. Okay, similarly T would be 2, 3, 2, 3. So let's try to make it look like that. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do is just multiply the bottom and the top by angle bracket 1, 2 and angle bracket 2, 3. So, Okay, so M super Yang Mills uh, is equal to, um, uh, well, I'll just write down angle bracket 1, 2, angle bracket 2, 3. And let me now take out the angle bracket 3, 4, angle bracket 4, 1, times delta 2 times 4 of Q times 1 over ST. Let me actually write it. Okay, so this is kind of cool. This guy, remember, has no weights at all. Q has no weights at all. N none of these things have any weights. All the helicity weights are carried by this uh, funny object. Now let's stare at this guy for a second. This is kind of a cool object. Okay, S angle bracket uh, square bracket one two over angle bracket three four. I'm going to call this guy X. And this is a really interesting object. Naively, it seems to depend on the ordering one two three and four. However, this thing is completely permutation invariant in switching the labels up to sign. Okay, picks up a sign for an odd permutation. So let's see why that is. I mean, obviously, if I flip one and two, it uh, picks up a sign. So there's your odd sign. But let's say I flip one and three. Okay, then I want to claim that three two over one four is equal to negative this thing, one two over 3, 4. And why is that? Well, let me cross multiply and bring everything to the right hand side. This is just a statement that 2, uh, this is just the uh, statement that uh, um, that uh, 2, 3, 3, 4 plus 2, 1, 1, 4 equals 0. And that's just momentum conservation. This is just telling us that 2 bracketed between P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4, 4 equals 0. So this is the sort of identity that we used all the time a few lectures ago, right? When we were writing I in terms of various ways and so on. But we see this cool thing that at four points, there's this interesting object, x, that's permutation invariant up to a sign. And it carries weight minus 1 in all the objects. 
okay, in all of 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, so having defined this object, M super Yang Mills is very, is very pretty. M super Yang Mills is delta 2 times 4q over st. And then all of the helicity weight is carried by x. And it's just x squared. All the little group weight is carried by x, and it's just x squared. Now, which way would you prefer to write the answer? Well, I would certainly prefer to write it the first way. right? The first way is a lot more, uh, the, uh, because in this way of writing it, the fact that the answer is cyclically invariant is not manifest. In order to see the answer is cyclically invariant, you have to observe that this funny object happens to be permutation invariant under, under uh, uh, permuting the indices because of momentum conservation. Whereas the standard way of writing the answer, what we just wrote with the angle brackets downstairs, is just cyclically invariant on the nose without saying anything about momentum conservation. Right? This cyclic symmetry is an obvious symmetry of the amplitudes and is in your face. You don't have to work to see that it's there. Okay. Now let's talk about gravity. And that's the formula that I wrote down incorrectly last time. So the four particle amplitude for gravity, m supergravity, is actually delta 2 times 8 of q. Okay, this other stuff I was emphasizing last time is perfectly correct, that there is this product of st and u, and that's important. But there's an overall x to the fourth in front of the whole thing. Okay, so that's the, that's the piece I didn't write. That carries all the helicity weight. But now there really is something conceptually interesting about this. It tells you that unlike the case of Yang-Mills, where there is an expression for the amplitude that's manifestly cyclically invariant, already at four points at tree level in supergravity, there is no super manifestly permutation invariant expression for the amplitude. There is not an expression that you just stare at it and say, aha, this is obviously permutation invariant. You have to know that you're on the support of momentum conservation to see that it's true. Okay? Now, that's not shocking. Gravity couples to momentum. The conservation of momentum is a critical aspect of the gravitational amplitudes making sense. So it's kind of a good thing that some crucial feature of gravity should rely on momentum conservation and should not be just so trivially, you know, uh, that so it follows so, uh, so uh, trivially. Okay, but it's still interesting. It tells you that while there was this beautiful all n formula for the uh, for the amplitudes with two negative helicity gluons and everything all positive helicity, the, the Park Taylor formula, and we could write it supersymmetrically, the analog for gravity nobody knew for a long time. Not similarly simple. Okay, now in one of the many sort of bolts from the blue. Uh, brilliant pieces of work that Andrew Hodges did in this subject. Hodges wrote down a formula five years ago now, five, six, six years ago, which was the analog of the Park Taylor amplitude for gravity. Okay, and, and we'll talk about it late, later in the course, if we get there, hopefully. It's an incredible formula. It's much fancier looking than the Park Taylor formula. It involves the construction of an interesting matrix. You have to take the Fafian of some interesting matrix. And it's not at all obviously permutation invariant, except for the fact that this is not a random matrix. It has a matrix that, because of momentum conservation, has some null directions. And so, uh, so while generically it would not be permutation invariant on the support of momentum conservation, it, it is. Okay? So that, that already tells you that there is more structure. Uh, and, yet, and yet, the final answer is much simpler in a literal computational sense than for Yang-Mills amplitude. Um, in Yang-Mills theory, if you really wanted the answer for the full amplitude, summing over all the orderings, you have a Park Taylor factor for each and order n factorial different orderings. <coughs> Hodge's formula for gravity involves a determinant that you can compute in n cubed time. <laughs> so in a literal sense, gravity amplitudes are vastly simpler than Yang-Mills amplitudes, but to see the structure, you have to be slightly more sophisticated uh, in your understanding of uh, Momentum conservation. In any case, this is the conceptual point I failed to talk about last time. It's very important, and we see it here uh, already. So actually, on your problem set, um, you're supposed to find this x to the fourth if you do, um, if you do things properly. Yes? What, what is the argument of permutation? Well, it's just a Bose symmetry. 
Okay, so we just have the, uh, that's what it is for the gluons as well, right? It's just that we have these, we, we have these multiplets and there's just, just, just the Bose and Fermi uh, symmetries for all the particles, right? That's, that's the beautiful thing, that when you don't work with, uh, when you work with components, this is, this, is, uh, uh, this is hidden. When you work in terms of the Grassmann coherent state, it's totally obvious. Okay, so those are the, the underlying Bose and Fermi symmetries of the, of the bosons and fermions turns into cyclic symmetry and permutation symmetry for the yang mills and the gravity amplitudes. Okay, now finally, let me talk about this thing at the end. Um, let's talk about uh, BCFW supersymmetrically. And here there's a real payoff to uh, all the things that we've been doing. Let's do SUSY BCFW. Now, remember beforehand, um, in BCFW, we said normal, normal BCFW shift is that we took two particles, let's say I and J, we take I and J, any two particles I and J, and we shift lambda tilde I goes to lambda tilde I plus Z lambda tilde J, and lambda J goes to lambda J minus z lambda i. And why did we do this thing where we had to shift two particles? Because we had to conserve momentum. Right? So we had to add something to one particle and subtract something from the other particle. OK. Now, remember, when we talked about BCFW, we said you have to be careful how you do the shift. It depends on the helicities of the particles. That you could, sh you could do a shift if, if it was, uh, I forget which, which way it was, minus plus or plus minus. One, one, one way uh, you could do, but the other way you could not do. And the behavior at infinity under BCFW shift was different than the two cases and so on. But if we think supersymmetrically, all this crap with the helicities is gone, right? But what should we be doing instead? So am I done here? I have some eta variables to talk about as well. So what do you think I should do to the eta tilde variables? Why did I do this funny shift on two guys? I want the momentum to be conserved. So I should do something to the eta tilde to make sure that the super momentum is conserved, that the supercharge is conserved, right? So in other words, I want to make sure that Q doesn't shift. I had a delta of Q. I mean, the amplitude is a delta of P. There's a delta of Q, and I want Q also not to shift in order to keep it supersymmetric. So how do I do that? Well, th the whole point of this notation is so you don't have to think. Eta has a tilde in it, so you should do the same thing to eta tilde as you do to lambda tilde. Okay? So the SUSY BCFW shift, so that's normal uh, uh, BCFW. SUSY BCFW is to now do the same thing here. Eta tilde I goes to eta tilde I plus Z eta tilde J. Okay, and let's see why this does the trick just trivially. Let's see what happens to Q under this shift. So remember Q, Q is the sum of lambda A, eta tilde A. So this contains lambda I, eta tilde I, plus lambda J, eta tilde J. And so what's happening under this shift? There's no lambda tildes up there, so this doesn't matter, but lambda J is shifting, but eta tilde I is shifting. So this is going to go to lambda i, eta tilde i plus z, eta tilde j. And this now is shifted lambda j minus z lambda i times eta tilde j. And once again, the cross terms cancel, and this just goes back to q. OK, so doing that shift on eta tilde is keeping is making this a supersymmetric shift. <laughs> and you'll notice that if you only loved helicities, what does this correspond to? This corresponds to a very weird shift where you combine all sorts of helicities of the different particles together in a very particular way. If you didn't know about supersymmetry, this would look like a very weird thing to do. Okay? But if you know supersymmetry, this is the only thing you can do. <laughs> it's the only thing you can do, it's the counterpart of keeping momentum conserved. And now what is the claim? The claim is that with no statement about helicities or being careful or anything, 
that under this super BCFW shift, under the super shift, all the amplitudes of lambda and lambda tilde and eta tilde go to some function of z, as we talked about before. And these always go like 1 over z for Yang Mills and for super Yang Mills and 1 over z squared for gravity. OK? And so you can just do BCFW. Any legs, anything you like, do anything you want. You don't have to be careful about anything, OK? Because all the amplitudes vanish at infinity. So you know the three particle amplitudes. You know the rules for gluing things together. Uh, you know everything, and so you can compute the uh, amplitude using super BCFW. On the problem set, I ask you to compute the four particle amplitudes using BCFW just to get practice for gluing these intermediate states and seeing what uh, everything looks like. Okay, why don't we uh, leave it at that? Um, so the, I, uh, I hope I, I fixed up um, uh, any confusions from last time. Um, uh, but just, just so you're prepared intellectually for where we're going next, starting next time, we're talking about, uh, there's still some physics. We're talking about um, uh, twisters and momentum twisters, conformal symmetry, dual conformal symmetry. So, um, uh, but that will motivate becoming world experts in projective geometry. Okay? So after that, I, I told you before we'd probably start this lecture doing it, but anyway. Uh, Starting in the middle of the next lecture, and then for another couple of lectures after that, we're going to spend a long time turning you all into expert projective geometers. Okay, so um, so bring that part of your brains to, to the lecture next time. <laughs>